You don't believe me, do you? It was starred a gentleman named Bill Murray, and it all centered around February the 2nd. That movie is Groundhog Day. You see, in Groundhog Day, Bill Murray is the weatherman. He goes to Pumstonia, Pennsylvania, and he is supposed to uh, tell us what the groundhog is going to do and all this kind of stuff. He makes a weather forecast that proves to be wrong. He's very cocky about it. And so the series of the movie is him waking up every day. It's Groundhog Day. It's February 2nd. And he goes, and he goes to the little, whatever it is, little burrow, Pumstonyville. He, he's less than enthusiastic about it, and, and he tries to escape. And this is, and that's it. Every day he wakes up, and it's the same thing. And it's the same thing. And it's the same thing. And, and over time, he, he knows he's in a time loop, but nobody else knows they're in this time loop. And so the makers of the film, and it really comes from a book, they, they think this time loop lasts about, lasts about 20 to 30 years until he can woo the girl, until he learns to play the piano. Um, and he, he goes from being a complete jerk to just being a, a swell guy that the, the entire town loves. Like they fall, they fall in love with him in a single day. That's how this has to happen. Ecclesiastes is exactly looking at life as though we are all in Groundhog Day. And so we wake up, we're, we're just back to the ground. It's the same thing. Every day, every day, every day. That's what we're going to see as we look at this. Let me read for us. If I can figure out how to work this thing. There we go. The words of the preacher. The son of David, king of Israel. Vanity of all vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of all vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down, and it hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south, oh, does it ever. The wind goes around to the north, around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness, a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, Groundhog Day. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of the latter things yet to be among those who come after. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and in my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, and I perceived that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Isn't that just a wonderful, wonderful thing? Yeah. Here's the thing. Here's what we're going to see. We're going to see a journal of often who is attributed as the wisest person who ever lived. 
And we're going to see his journal, his quest for happiness. It's his happiness project. Because here's the thing. Originally, I, I thought, well, it's really a man looking for the meaning or purpose in life. But listen, nobody goes around saying, I'm going to look search for meaning and purpose in life. You know what everybody's looking for in life? They're looking for happiness. Right? Everybody's looking for happiness, and they all think they're going to find it somewhere different. That's what every commercial that will come on television today is going to tell you. You're going to be happy if you do this. You're going to be happy if you buy this. And so it's the people then and now searching, searching for something to fill us, to sustain us, something that's good. And so we need to uncover a couple things. We need to uncover who the preacher is, and we need to uncover his message. That's really what we're going to see throughout all of Ecclesiastes. Right? So here's the preacher. Right? He, he, he says, he identifies himself as the preacher more than once here. And he calls himself the king of Jerusalem. The preacher is translated Koholeth in Hebrew. So we would read our Bible before reading here. We'd read it Koholeth. Ecclesiastes in Greek. That's, we, that's where we get this word. And somehow that's how we get this title. Preacher is probably not a very fair thing for us to say. Because his message, most of the time, is anything but God. And, and really, the, the way it would translate is, remember when you were in school and you had an assembly speaker? They would come and be like, hey, at 2 o'clock today, you're not going to have class. You're going to get this assembly speaker. And he's going to come talk to you about, you know, don't punch somebody in the face. Don't, don't do this. I think now in our school, it's like vaping. There's all these things. Whatever the hot topic was, the schools wanted to get across. So that, that's this word. He's the assembly speaker. And so it's kind of fair that we would take the word and we would make a preacher. But really, today, we would call him the guru. We would call him the expert. Right? He's the wise one. And what is he doing? He is searching for truth. He's searching for happiness. And in the process of this, what he's doing is he's wandering away from God. Not towards it. It's not until we get to the end of the book that he finally comes and he goes, Oh, yeah, God. I, I should have been checking out God this whole time. You, you see, we attribute this, and I think we should, we attribute this to King Solomon. Right? As we read our Old Testament, we understand ancient Israel. There were three kings of what's called the United Kingdom King Saul, King David, and then David's son, Solomon. And then after that, the kingdom was split into the north and the south. And Solomon is the most interesting man in the world. He is rich beyond measure. And so what he does, and we see this, his heart gets chased away by all of the women from foreign countries. And he, his heart is chased away after all of the idols that are associated with all of these foreign countries and all of these women. And so somewhere in the midst of this wandering away from God, he starts experimenting with life. He's not all that different than the celebrities that we see today. They have literally everything they could ever want, and still they're not happy. And so they, their, their, their first wife wasn't good enough, so let's get another wife. A billion dollars wasn't enough, so let's get another billion. I, I, this, this company wasn't good enough, let's get another company. It's, it's really not all that different. And so what we're seeing is Solomon over the course of his life. He's the celebrity of all celebrities. He's, he's the headline every time the news comes on. He's like the Hall of Fame quarterback, the lead singer, the artist, the author, the screenwriter, the president, the billionaire, all rolled into one. Elon Musk wishes he could have been King Solomon. He's like an Oprah type figure, a Bill Gates type figure. And what we're reading is his journey on his quest for happiness. What we're, what, so what we're peering into is his talk show, his podcast. It's his TED Talk. He's the brightest, the wealthiest, the most powerful, and perhaps even the most handsome there could ever be. 
And here's the thing. All of it detached from God. It's all empty. But here's the thing. When, when a billionaire comes on the TV, we think, well, they've got a billion dollars. They must be pretty smart. They must have life figured out. And so by nature of their success, we think they must be wise. and something we can learn from them. And we're easily enticed. Everybody is easily enticed by the things that are clever, by the things that are beautiful. And listen, by a billion dollars. Right? If, if I had a billion dollars, I could give every person in this room Ten million dollars, and I would still have a little bit left over. That's a lot of money. King Solomon makes a billion dollars look like nothing. He's blowing his nose with hundred dollar bills. <laughs> and so there's this there's this thought that oh man, he has it together. He must be so great, but he's unwinding in the midst of that. So we see the preacher, but we need to see also the message. And the message isn't what we hope it would be. The message of Ecclesiastes is this. Everything found under the sun is vanity. Everything found under the sun is empty. It's meaningless. It's pointless. All right, let's pray. Let's go home. Vanity is mentioned 38 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Under the sun, this phrase appears 30 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and what we're going to find is he's going he's to go with his billions of dollars, with his incredible intellect, with all the power at his disposal, and he's going to say, well, you know, that didn't bring me the joy I was looking for. What's next? What's next? And so in the course of all these things, it's this happiness project. Really, Ecclesiastes is found in the, what we call the wisdom literature of the Bible. And wisdom literature usually looks like this. If you do this, nine times out of ten, this is what's going to happen to you, good or bad. Ecclesiastes doesn't work that way. Ecclesiastes says, if you do this, it's stupid. My kids are like, oh. That's, 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 the, that's the angst of this book. That's the cynical tone that this book takes. It's an anti-wisdom. It's a, well, if you do this, you're going to do it too. And here's what you're going to find. Whatever. Good luck with life. And, and, and so you look at life and you feel empty. And you, you see what the, quote, wisest person in the Bible is, is offering. And you say, well, your wisdom is empty. And yes, that's exactly it. Everything found under the sun will prove vain. It will prove empty. So what does he start to explore, right? I'm the preacher. And then he starts looking at creation. He looks at how the wind blows one way and it blows the next. How the sea fills up. And yet the sea is never full and it's never empty. And, and so it's all operating on this creation cycle. The sun rises, the sun sets. And then the next day it happens again. Well, it's sunny as Cher that plays on Groundhog Day every time he hits the alarm. They said I never was. Groundhog Day, man. Ecclesiastes. Creation is cyclical and it's vain. That's, so, so he's looking out. He's, he's looking out his window. As sunny as Cher play on his alarm clock, he goes, again? This is what's going on? And then, and so then he starts to think, well, maybe... Maybe my life will be important if I get to the end of it and somebody remembers me. And then what does he say? Everything is eventually going to be forgotten. You know, I've mentioned it before. Is I can't tell you the names of my great-grandparents. I never met them. I, I know that they're jotted down in a genealogy somewhere if I wanted to research. But off the top of my head, I have no clue. I'm going to assume there was somebody named Singleton at some point. And then to make it matters harder on the other side, it's Smith, because there's nobody named Smith. 
So what does what does he do? Solomon goes, ah, you're gonna get forgotten, I'm gonna get forgotten. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. So he, he looks at history and he goes, I don't know about this. But then he does something else. He starts to look and he's like, I applied my heart to wisdom and to knowledge and to gain understanding. Right? If I could just get a little bit more knowledge in me. Maybe if I could just learn a little bit more. You see, every generation does this. They think they're on the cusp of the next form of the enlightenment. That we're going to be smarter than the previous generation. That we're going to have it more figured out. And so what does Solomon say? Wisdom too is limited. And therefore, it's vanity. This is just encouraging, right? Yes. The preacher in his quest... Here's the thing. This preacher, this book is exactly what people live and die for today. Period. This is exactly what people are doing. And ultimately, no one but God will tell you that what you're searching after is vanity. You see, this book, as strange as it is, as strange as it is, is in our Bible. We believe that all scripture is breathed out by God. It is therefore it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So Ecclesiastes is God speaking to you and to me. God speaking to great men and beyond. To say there's an error in our ways. And it's God's loving kindness, right? I can think of so many things. If my kids want to get a buck, and I'd be like, oh man, can we go to the toy store? I'd be like, I don't know what you're going to buy for a buck, but sure, it's your buck. We'll go, and they'll get the cheapest little trinket that was probably made for a penny, and it, it got put on a freighter, and it came all the way here, and then after, after about 30 minutes, playing with it over and over, squishy balls, man, those have been popping in my house for 10 years. All of a sudden, it pops, it breaks, it goes, what? That was my dollar! Hey, buddy, you like, oh, sorry. And so, in my loving kindness and kind of my cynical nature, I say, I mean, what did you expect, buddy? What did you expect, guys? God is stooping in with Ecclesiastes and saying, listen, I want to warn you before you put your life on the same quest as Saul. I want to lovingly train you and teach you that if you look for things outside of me to make you happy, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It may make you happy for 30 minutes. It may make you happy for 30 days. You may be even happy for 30 years. But ultimately, there's something better. And so what does it say? Even in verse 13, I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom. All that is done under heaven. Notice that phrase, right? Under heaven, everything done under the same, up under the sun, it's the same. To search it out, and it says, it is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of men. Right? Are, are you living in this unhappy business world? Right? It, it's, it's this, how do I make sense I mean, really, our world is trying to do this. They're trying to make sense of life and death. That's what Solomon did here. I, I, I joke that Ecclesiastes, Groundhog Day is about Ecclesiastes. The other thing I feel like Ecclesiastes is, I feel like it's a, trying to fold a fitted sheet. You ever try to, if you're not laughing, you've never tried to fold a fitted sheet. Right? It's like, well, if I just get this cooler, I stuff it in here, and by the end of it, you're just like, I'm just going to put it in the ball and just kick it in the closet, close the door as fast as I can. Or just put it right back on the bed. Right? And so Ecclesiastes is like this, trying to fold this, it's trying to make sense, trying to have everything fit in there. And what it's teaching us is that everything done under the sun is empty. So what does this leave? Right? If, if we just take this, we go, okay, there's the preacher. You know, he, he had a lot going for him. This is the message. All right, do we just uh, adopt a cynical view? And listen, our world is adopting that. Our world is absolutely adopting that. 
adopting this cynical view. <clears throat> this is all life has to offer, so I, I might as well just live it up and do whatever I can. Right? It's, it's very fatalistic. We're all going to die someday. Right? He who dies with the most toys wins. Right? Very cynical, fatalistic view. And maybe you found yourself, maybe not saying the exact words of Solomon, Maybe you've said the words more like, what's the point? What's the use of being sacrificed? You wake up the next day and you ask the same question again. Right? That you never seem to get ahead. That life feels like you're turning in circles, right? What's being described here, the wind goes to the north, the wind goes from the south. It's a whirlwind. It's a whirlwind. And it's just turning. It's just turning. Your life is a whirlwind. It's just turning in circles. You're not getting anywhere. Nothing's changing. Maybe you're trapped. You feel mundane. Maybe you experience pain. I think Ecclesiastes might have been penned after a day of doing the laundry just to turn around the next day and do laundry again. Maybe you're, you're in a whirlwind of guilt in your life. And you just can't seem to escape it. Your life is just a, a circle of regret. And you've moved from one regret to the next, and you, you haven't made it anywhere. And so you're just circling in vanity. And you try to do everything you can in your own strength to break the cycle, to break whatever bondage you're experiencing. And yet it still feels like you're trapped in a whirlwind. You're trapped in a February 2nd, everyday kind of life. Or... Instead of being cynical, fatalistic, you could search for something better. C.S. Lewis, he said this in Mere Christianity, he said, history, human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. The long, terrible history of man trying, man searching for something other than God which will make him happy. So where do we go? Where do we, where do we look? There's this scene, it's, it's in 1 Kings 10, and Jesus highlights it in Matthew. Matthew 12 says this. It says, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment. That's the queen of Sheba. With this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. She came a long way. She came with great gifts. And Jesus says, behold, something greater than Solomon. Something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus has just gone, and he's been talking about how he's greater than the temple. And they're not really understanding that, because they're looking at the temple, they're like, nothing's greater than the temple. Jesus is like, I'm greater than the temple. And then he, he, he inserts this towards the end, right? They're, they're, they're wanting a sign. And Jesus says, I'm, something greater than Jonah is here, is in essence what he's saying, right? You're going to get the sign of Jonah, Right, that like Jonah, the Son of Man will be three days in the belly of the earth, and he will rise. And, like, what are you talking about? and then he inserts this: something greater than Solomon is here. Right, that Jesus is the greater preacher, and Jesus has a greater message. <laughs> and so, you and I, we have this unique ability in this time we live in with the word that we have. That we see better than Solomon. Think about that. Solomon, the most interesting man in all the world. We see and understand something better than Solomon. We see it more fully than Solomon. We see greater than the Queen of the South. Right? What is, and so what does she do? 
She traveled, it says, the ends of the earth, searching for something. See, she went on her own happiness quest. She, she had her own happiness project, and she, it led her to Solomon. And she was overwhelmed. She's like, wow, like, this is ten times better than everything that was described to me. There's something better. Right? Our, our searching should lead us to say, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something better, and there is. That searching should send us to Jesus. Right? In the, in the whirlwind of life, the whirlwind you experience of life, we should search for Jesus. We should search for Jesus. Right? That we would go, if, if the Queen of the South will go from the ends of the earth looking for Solomon. I mean, how far will you go to search out Jesus, to search out the depths and the riches and the goodness of Jesus? And I'm not just talking in like, uh, like a, a really simplistic way. Oh, yeah, Jesus is the answer. Jesus will make it better. Because, listen, it's not that easy. When you're trapped in the time loop, when you're trapped in the whirlwind of life, when nothing seems to get better, when your prayers don't seem answered, when you just go from one hurt to the next, when it just seems like it's bad news after bad news after bad news, and you're trapped in the, man, one day starts, the day ends, the day starts, the day ends. No, you, you have to get your bearings about it. You, you have to search out, and you have to find where Jesus is in the midst of your life and how he's speaking into what's going on in your life. And so how do we search for Jesus? We have to hear him. Right? That's what the queen came to do. She wanted to just hear. Right? She came from the ends of the earth just to hear from Solomon. Right? Do you want to hear from Jesus more than all of the other voices? Listen, there are a lot of voices in this world. There are a lot of heavily praised voices. Right? They're valued. Well, this person's got a billion dollars. Well, this person has ten billion dollars. Well, this person has a hundred billion dollars. Oh, well, this person, look how pretty they are. Well, this person, man, look how successful they've been. And so you just go from one thing to the next and you just keep, keep looking? Or do you really want to, to seek an audience with Jesus? Rather than, because listen, most of the places we turn are just whirlwinds. You woke up this morning, the news can be on. You go to bed tonight, the news can be on. You get up tomorrow morning, it's the news. Probably the same person from yesterday morning. And what are they telling you? Stuff's bad. Stuff's not bad today. Maybe tomorrow will be less bad than today was. A whirlwind. The news is just a whirlwind. TikTok for younger people is just a whirlwind. All the stories and reels, all the things you could ever binge on YouTube are all whirlwinds. And so what do we do? We look at Jesus. You, you, you don't need to understand. Jesus never set out on a happiness project. Because you want to know who the real wise person who ever lived is? It's Jesus. It's not Solomon. Solomon existed to help point us to Jesus. But there was going to be somebody far wiser, far happier, Greater in every single way is Jesus. And so Jesus didn't have to come along and go, I applied my heart to wisdom and understanding so that I could learn the meaning of life. Not Jesus, he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to find 110 ways to fail at life in order to tell you what to actually look for in life. He didn't have to go through a, a course of 1,001 things 
that won't make you happy. So what do we do? You go to Jesus. He lived this life. He lived in this world. And you know what? If anybody could have penned this, it could have been Jesus. Jesus could have said, it's all vanity. Don't even try. You should just give up now while the gift is good. That's not what he did. That's not what he did. Well, where was Jesus' life directed at? It was directed at the Father. And in the, word, the heaviest the whirlwind got in his life, what did he do? He, he pressed harder into Scripture, and he pressed harder into the heart of his Father. So come, sit at his table. Be like the Queen of the South, but with Jesus. Come pull up a seat at the table of Jesus and say something greater really is here. To be like the woman at the well who said, come hear a man who told me all about my life and everything I, I needed. Come find it for yourself. Be amazed like the queen to Solomon. I, I want to encourage you this week, I want to encourage you to identify some of the whirlwinds that you're chasing in life. Like the ones that you can put aside. Like feeding your family is probably not one of those whirlwinds that you can just ignore for a week. I wouldn't recommend putting off laundry for terribly long. Right? Smelling good is... is just fine. But there are other whirlwinds. Maybe it's through your phone. Maybe it's through your television. Maybe it's how you use your idle time. Maybe it's how you experience recreation and leisure. And, and, and to really just say, why am I doing this? What am I looking for in doing this? And to take one or some of those times and, and, I, and I want to, to encourage you to do that. This is, this is what I was, I, I, I tripped into this, this application this week. I didn't mean to. I had to just read some extra scripture. Not for, I mean, it was, it was for my men's group, and, and so I just started reading. And as I read, what happened is all of a sudden, scripture washed over my mind and my heart. And in that moment while I was reading, all of a sudden, it's like the whirlwind stopped. So I would encourage you to think about the time you spend with Jesus. Sunday mornings isn't enough. Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights isn't enough. I want you to think about it in two ways. There's a, a quality of time and a quantity of time. Right, if I, if I were to say, man, how, if you were to say, how, how much time do you spend with your family? I was like, oh, man, I'm with my family all the time. And if by all the time I meant, well, we're going through the drive through and we're in the car, and when I look in the rearview mirror, I see my kid's face. You wouldn't, you wouldn't say, well, that sounds like some great quality time. I, 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 we, we did that. Two weeks ago, we were, we, were, we were in the car for the same amount of time we were at our destination. And by the end of it, we were all exhausted. We were all done. And none of us were going, you know what, that was a great quality family time. And then there's a quantity. There's a quantity, right? Just like a, a, a family or, or a husband and wife, they're just moving from one place to the next. They just exist as roommates. No, that's not vibrant. That's not full. Here's the thing. This is not exactly how we treat Jesus. We just move from one thing to the next. We, we come in and it's like, well, I got my little Sunday fix. Let's on to the next thing. What you're doing is you're stepping in. You're going to step out of this place and you're going to go, all right, back to the whirlwind. 
And you're going to say, oh, I sure hope this whirlwind's better than the last whirlwind. I sure hope this Monday's better than the last Monday. Jesus is so amazing. We should absolutely search him out. But listen, we don't have to get into a caravan. We don't have to load up camels and riches to go and search out Jesus. Because when you go back into your work tomorrow, or maybe even today, and you go, man, how many more years till I retire? <laughs> when you step into that whirlwind, you, you don't have to, you don't have to be transported and transcend to someplace. Jesus came to you. Jesus understands this world so well because he made it and he lived in it. He saw the whirlwinds that we exist in. He saw, God knew that we couldn't escape our own, so he came to us. And he didn't jerk through life, he didn't wander and search through life. Oh no. He is the perfect man. And so, this Jesus sees you. He sees your every effort. He hears your worries. He hears your ambitions. And when you're confused and unsatisfied, Jesus knows that too. You weren't meant to be satisfied with the things of this world. Thirty times under the sun. 38 times vanity under the sun. Everything under the sun is vanity. But there's some things that don't exist under the sun. And so, spoiler alert, that's where we find our happiness. That's where we find something richer and better. And so we mark out some time to identify your whirlwinds this week. Right? The, the ones that you can't, you, you, there's the ones you can't put off, like work. But there are plenty you can. Maybe it's your screen time. Maybe it's your leisure time. Maybe it's how you use or don't use conversation time. And then set aside real, a real quantity of time with Jesus, where you open your Bible and you say, God, these are your words to me. I don't want to exist in this world. I don't want to just go from day to day to exist. I know I'm here for more than just time. Make some money. And then die. And then set aside real quality time. When you shut out everything else, you say, Man, I just I just want to be there. I want, I want to meet. Where you just pull up a seat and you just expect God is with me, God is here, and I'm listening. So God speak. And, and, and lastly, if you're here. And maybe your life has existed in a whirlwind of guilt. Maybe it's existed in this whirlwind of regret. And you just go, man, I just can't seem to get beyond my sin. I can't get, seem to get right with God. I can't seem to just do enough that God would finally be pleased or happy with me. You're, you're right. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus died on your behalf. You can never do anything to ascend to God. So he descended to you. He died the death you deserve, but he rose to give you life. And so listen, if you're here and you have no relationship with God, you're not sure even what that means. Here, here in a minute, the musician's going to lead us in a song, and I'm going to be down front. I would love to visit with you and help you understand. Maybe you're dealing with a really heavy whirlwind. I would love to visit with some of you and pray with you if I can. 
Just because it's the way it is doesn't mean it's the way it has to be. And it's certainly not the way God wants it to be. So don't leave here like Solomon. Don't, don't walk into your week in the whirlwind and looking at it like Solomon. In your whirlwind, search for Jesus. Wherever you're at, whatever the whirlwind, they're all different. Search them out. It's worth it. We ask you to see this coming. Jesus, thank you.